Good evening, everyone. And I would like to start this confessing, as Joanna D'Angelo mentioned, that I know nothing about emotion. It's, um, it's a joy to be here. We know some of you um, were here when I was, um, we were presenting the, this topic um, that we will be talking about uh, since the beginning of the month. You know, when we came together and we decided that we, what we're going to talk about, what we're going to present, what we're going to share with one another, right? And uh, here we are um, talking about emotion and education. It's not by chance. We had two great individuals talking about New Year, New You, and the World by Daniel and Kirsten talking about thought and will. And here we're talking about emotion education. It seems like that you know, we put something together, it has to be in this pattern, it has to be this way, this person will talk about that. But sometimes our mentors just um, come and, and invite us to really shake off, right, to do things. And since then, I have to say that the Miranda rights um, kept rolling my mind over and over and over. We all know what the Miranda rights are, right? Um, can, can you guys say it? It's not law school. You have the, you have the right to remain silent. No, not yet. Anything that you say may and will be used against you in the court of law, right? You have the right to have a lawyer, and if you cannot afford a lawyer, we'll give you one. <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of weird, and and yes, I am sharing a feeling that I had um, when we were when we came in contact with this idea of talking about emotion. But for one reason, I'm saying this is that. Whenever we are presented an opportunity, we shorten ourselves, saying, I can't talk about this, or I will not talk about this, this. You know, we expose our fears, and consequently, we're directly, you know, dealing with our emotions, and we don't even think about it, right? And the fear sometimes may come for what we know, what we don't know, the connection with one another um, that we have, thinking that others will come and, right, judge us by what we're saying, and we're not doing yet, because we're not there. We're not there. But when we say that you have, we have the right to have a lawyer on the Miranda rights, I'm going to quote um, Emmanuel saying that the best um, uh, lawyer that we have is our good deeds. So this, in fact, is our good deeds that we can be sharing with one another. This time, talking, your opportunity to listen, to giving me the opportunity to listen as well about what we're going to bring here, it's quite enlightening. This past week, we also... Um, take a step back. Whenever we're talking about bringing a topic, whenever we're talking about something, we tend to relate or find what we're thinking, what we're talking about, what we're going through um, with everything that we live, right? If we're suffering, we want to connect with someone who's suffering. If we are, you know, happy, we're going to connect with someone who's happy. So this, back, this past Monday, we celebrated what? Dr. King's birthday, right? And this the, the past week, past Saturday, we uh, right after we finished the, the uh, kitchen talk, we we you know we said, well, let's go ahead and find out what are these holidays, what it, with the true meaning behind it, and we we reminded about Dr. King's, you know, wh who he was and all those things. Kirsten, um, um, very very wisely at the end of her talk, um, she went to the back and she started putting for the kids to listen, the kids to. Um, kind of have a better understanding of the um, the um, the um, speech. I have a dream, right? And it's very nicely put, very nicely done. And uh, in, and uh, I promise Angelina as well that you know we would go home listening to because here we were doing other things. We we're you know finalized the evening as well. We had to go. So here I am, you know, in the car listening to these things with the kids, and it's very enlightening. You, once you start, you want to you know, listen over and over and over and over and over. And we did study a little bit more. And uh, there is a part of the, of, the, um, of the speech that he says that in 1963, that was the, with the year, that there was not the end, but it was a beginning, beginning of the movement. And it's very enlightening, you know, to hear this and say, hmm, it's not the end, it's actually a beginning. Or we can say, a restart, a rebeginning, right? A new beginning, even though something had already started. As he said, five score years before by Lincoln. 
right, this movement of freeing the slaves, um, making sure we had some equality, even though a century before we had in our constitution, what? That men are created equal, so on and so forth, all those things. And we still see it nowadays. It's not perfect. The system is not perfect. We have some much, way more equality than, than we had in those days. But we still have to make some progress. But the, the analogy here, or the, com the com comparison that we'd like to make, is that when we talk about emotion, we're still here, 2,000 years after the men, the master came and taught us about emotions, and taught us about this change of behaviors, analyzing yourself, changing yourself. So much so, we heard here today, which is one of the uh, passages that we will talk about, Lazarus talking about love. Right? When Jesus came and said th the word love, can we imagine how people start shaking? <laughs> it was that change that you know, we don't see in our days. I think the only perception that we have with this is, or, or the only way we can compare with this is when, for example, an elderly person that we respect so much comes and tells so us something. Obviously, we have to have the open heart to, to hear, to listen. Um, and they tell us something that we're like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? This is amazing. And you hear and you feel it. It's that feeling that comes that, you're, that you have with whatever teaching that individual is bringing us, the, the wise individual coming. Most importantly, because that individual also has some baggage, some, some examples in life that truly emphasizes that what they were saying is the best way to go, the best thing to do, and you respect. You create that respect. Because you're able to also associate, not only, um, you, you, don't, you don't only hear the words, but you associate with some of the directions that that person has established in their lives. And it went well. So you're like, no, I better follow this person. Again, you have to have the ears to hear. So when we talk about emotional education, when we talk about a new topic, when, we, when we're invited to do new things, don't consider the end, but a beginning or a restart, because we have been starting these things. Some of these things we have you know, heard before. When we talk about education, when we talk about emotion, feelings, we have many times mentioned this here, and quite frankly, I may have to restart again tomorrow, even though I may consider this my restart. Or I may invite someone to restart today. I may have to re-invite re the person again to restart tomorrow. So it's not the end. It's the beginning of something. And that gives us a sense of opportunity, of inclusion, not putting us aside. Correct? So let us, in this topic of a new beginning, a new thought, along with me that knows nothing about education, <laughs> let us just try and understand a little bit about ourselves. Let's just understand. Who are we? A spirit. Or you were a spirit, have an incarnated experience. So we're not a spirit, we're not a, the body. We're something else. Based on what the teachings that Kardec brings to us in the spirits. What is it? When a, when a spirit is in a physical body, the spirit is what? A soul, right? A soul. The definition, it's, it's, it's important for us to bring these definitions because it gives us a sense of direction. It gives us the base for this understanding of, of edu um, ev emotions. And we have to understand who we are. And we're going to see that that's actually one of the steps for us to become a better individual later on. But we are spirit, right? And we, um, we have this, this physical body. So, so we're spirits incarnated. Now, does, who feels whatever we're feeling right now? It's cold outside. Is it the spirit or the physical body? The physical body, right? So would I say that being compassionate is something that the, 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 the act of being compassionate, and we're saying the act, 
not just the superficial feeling, the act. Is the body or the spirit? The spirit that is manifested through the body, the physical body. We see this now. It's cold outside. Who is feeling it? The physical body. But why do we complain? It's the body who's feeling it. <laughs> why do we complain? Why do we, oh my God, it's, you hear Leo all the time. Really? Where's summer? Where's summer? It's not an accept, it's a non accepting mind. Okay, well, yes, but. But what about the person who accepts it? It's okay. If you're happy, it's cold outside. Some people do like it. I, I don't know how. Maybe I have to reincarnate in Alaska or something that, you know, as we saw Lazarus say, you know, reincarnation is the second word of the alphabet, which we'll see here again. Maybe I have to reincarnate on those, those areas. However, the, the spirit is, the, the physical body is accessing that, that, that feeling, that sensation, right? And we were processing that feeling. So we have these physical feelings that is being processed through the body. The spirit has also, we can call spirits, um, spiritist, um, not a spiritist, but the, the feelings of the spirit or the sensations, right, that connected how we process this, we will have what? Emotions. You see now? Because there is the influence of the outside. And this goes with anything that we do. I look at the chairs. I associate, I love the chair because I like blue. Oh, I like the walls because it's blue. That will imprint us somehow and we will with our feelings that we have already established inside of us. And we'll see a little bit more how those came to be. We will express our emotions. When we were talking with someone and uh, we are already ex expecting an answer. Or sometimes when we look at one another, we, why is that person looking at me? Right? Why are this happening? Is it judgment? Is it, why do we, we, why do we show A emotion or not B emotion? All these things we have to become aware. And it's a quest. It's a beginning because to be even aware of this um, reanalysis of our thoughts, of our feelings, it's a lot of work. It burns a lot of calories. <laughs> it burns a lot of calories. But we get the point, right? That is the, the outside with what's inside of me, which I have been carrying with me, developing inside of me. When I say inside of me, within the self, the spirit, okay? And um, projecting or, or, or externalizing the emotion. As we were saying, here we are. We are spirits at the human level, and we have our physical body, spirits, we have our physical body, and the pair spirit. The pair spirit is this way that we connect with the physical body, without which there is no way for us to get to this point of having connection with this body. There, was, there would be no way for us to feel the cold Am I contradicting myself? Because I can come here and say, well, Leo, but I heard that in some of these books, or I read in some of these books in Lost Lord, that the spirit was suffering, the spirit was feeling cold, the spirit was feeling that he was still attached to the body, feeling things as the body was decomposing. How does that work? There is a still a connection between the this, this spirit and the body. So let's not fool ourselves that they don't feel. They feel. A question that Juliana posed to us when she was studying on Spike, um, studying the book Violets of, on, the of, on the Window, about the necessity of having the garments, right? The clothes, taking a shower, all these things. The development of the spirit will tell the things that we have to do, and how much we are connected still with matter. It may not be this type of matter, but it will be a different type of matter <laughs> that they are still connected to, their perispirit more dense, therefore they still have to wear the garment. When we 
we also see on the Nosso Lord, the picture, everybody walking and, you know, with nice garments and all. I think it's pretty cool. One day, hopefully, we'll, you know, walk like that. But we see that they still need uh, the garments. The feelings are still associated with the degree, the level of, um, of, of perception of the environment where they are, right? This right here is the spiritual body, as we were trying to say, and it's another topic for us to study another day, which for us to get into more details as far as the spiritual body. But this is who we are right now. Now, we are spirit, but for us to get to this point where we are, and we're trying to, again, just you know, make some points here before we can get to the, you know, on how we will, con you know, the things that we will do to uh, maintain the level of, or, let's say, a, a good emotions in our lives. Before we got to, uh, to this, this, this capability of processing things the way we're processing, the capability of, of uh, create things the way we create, technology, um, even as Kirsten says, 20 to 30 years ago, before that, we would never hear about this thing of emotion the way we're right now, the the um, emotional intelligence, as we will see here, the the great author, Daniel Goleman, right? Here now, it's something so so natural for us to hear about it. Take care of your emotions, you know. When it's not like, shut up, don't talk about it, <laughs> you know. It's like let's let's talk about it. Let's just kind of calm down and understand why do we feel this way. Even parenting is different nowadays. There, you know, the old ways to, to, um, to dis discipline the kid is not the same way that we used to have. Daniel and I know about it, right, Daniel? <laughs> Anyways, um, here we are. About 3.5 to 1 billion years ago, this spiritual principle, not the spirit, was in this mineral interchange, right? Again, with one mineral with the other, connecting in this beautiful transition, transitioning to the vegetable state, right? As we see the plants, we still see them, we still see them. And then 300 million years ago, the animal, the becoming the, the primate in the, in the animal kingdom three million years ago, and then human about 200,000, uh, the homo sapiens, and then the time of Moses, um, 3.3 thousand years ago, um, and here we are. In this transition that we went through, the spiritual principle before became through the hands of our creator, um, through the hands of our um, architects, as Andrea Luis likes to put on Evolution to Worlds, right? The beautiful minds that comes and helps, you know, God with all this transition. What did we do? We just sat there and did nothing. We acquired what? Experiences. So many experiences, so much so in, in through ma throughout so many years that they're still talking loud. And we see it when we turn on the news. We see it when we um, go to work at home, when we come to the Spirit Center, when we read these works, we see it every day, people fighting, people um, doing things that to some of us, it's like, are you kidding me? To some others, oh, they were just defending themselves. It's just a reaction. Well, there's a lot to be learned, a lot to be studied about it. But this is the evolution. And this is to show how long we have been in this transition, right, of changing and assimilating things, repetition, uh, trying to do this way, trying to do that way. So we go and, and, and we try to change it overnight. It's not going to happen. But here's the beginning, because now we have the, the understanding. We will bring this again. I don't know what happened to my fonts up there. I do apologize. <laughs> this incarnate is a little more like discarnating. <laughs> but there is an incarnate up there. But here we are, the spirit, pair, spirit, and body. This is us. We have these two elements, right? Quite different from what 
the discarnate, truly discarnated, right, right over here, has the spirit and the pair spirit. Why are we showing this? Again, to, for us to understand that perhaps they do not have the physical body like we do, but they're also feeling, they're also exchanging information with us, thus they have their sentiments, and because this is a semi-material body, they still have what? The affection, the sensations that we have. And what these two connections, these two feelings connected from the, from the, the pair spirit, as much as we have from the physical body, do for them? Creates what? Emotions. And we're going to add another element right here that if we go to conventional science that have done a great job, as Kirsten said, is they're doing, we have taken a, a leap on, on the idea of, of emotions. That they, unfortunately, they cannot bring this element to the, the, the equation. What happened? We interact. And then it, what happens? It multiplies. Because if I like to drink, what's going to happen? I will assimilate. I will be connected with other individuals who like to drink. They will all, also partake on the ability that I have to drink, on the decision that I, that I make to drink. Now, who wants to drink? The body or the physical body? The, the, the spirit or the physical body? Mm, good question, isn't it? You see, we're thinking, and that's the idea. For us to think that whenever I feel the urge to do something, I can ask myself, is this me or my physical body? I can blame the body, but why is my body this way? Why is my body in the morning asking, oh, just five more minutes, ten more minutes, and then you snooze, and then you snooze, and then you snooze. Some of us have this problem, so don't ask who that is. So, Right? Why do we do that? When some people can just get up and go. Why do people have time, problem with time? No, th these are questions that sometimes we, we look at and say, like, mm, why, why am I like this? Why is the other individual this way? So then it comes the piece of education. The self-analysis, the analysis of the environment as well. The analysis, when we say of the self and the, 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 um, of the environment, not in the sense of what's going on now, because it's very easy for us to see what happens now, what's happening now. But what has happened in the past for us to get to the point where we are now? We see? I can say that, OK, the problem is now. I have a group of friends that they call me every week. Leo, let's go to the bar. Leo, let's go to this place. I'm just giving you exaggerated you know, ideas here or examples. But it's true. And we say, OK, but how do I get to know? How do I get to know these friends? How do I, got to, how do I get to be in this position? Something happened in the past. What led me to go into that situation of meeting these individuals? Responsibility comes to you know, surface. And a, a, an idea of self-control now, because now I'm asking myself, how did I get here? It wasn't somebody who just put me there. You see you know, that when we look at these things, it's not just for us to see and, OK, incarnate, discarnate but to see how we interact as well, because that's one of the things that spiritism does for us, is allowing us to understand the connection that we have with the spiritual world. It is then, as we mentioned, that we would talk about, that we come in contact with this beautiful, amazing um, passage from Lazarus on the Gospel According to Spiritism, cha chapter 11, ver um, item 8, and I believe either Juliana or Sarah read it um, earlier today, that Lazarus starts by saying this. At, the origin, at their origin, humans have only instincts. More advanced and corrupted, they have only sensations. More educated and purified, they have, their sen they have sentiments. The, the exquisite ex effects of sentiment is love. Not love in the ordinary sense of the term, but that inner sun that condenses and joins 
at its ardent focal point all superhuman aspirations and revelation. You see the steps? You see the steps? Now, where are we on this, this picture? Where are we here? Are we in, under following our instincts? <laughs> are we already showing sensations? Okay, we're, but we're not purified yet, for sure, right? For example, and this is interest for, and we'll see a little, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the idea of, of instinct. But Kardec explains on, oh, um, which is not here, in the um, Genesis, talking about um, instincts. Instincts, for example, the, the act of walking is instinct. When you throw your leg, you know, in front of you and the other one, the other, this act is instinct. That you go and walk. Now, when you stop and you turn, or you turn because you see something, then is what? Us processing our free will. Reacting or acting on that instinct that we have, that we have developed many, 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 many reincarnations ago. So we are taking these baby steps. Baby steps. This is not the whole text, by the way. And then he says, the law of love replaces the personality with the unit of all beings and ex extinguishes societal, mi societal misery. Happy are they who, overcoming their human nature, love with a great love their brothers and sister in suffering. So, again, baby steps, because we're not there yet, and we need to overcome this human nature that we have. When he's talking about the human nature, it's these instincts that we have, which will never, in a way, come to cease or disappear, because we we'll, we'll have this, and Kardec very eloquently talks about this idea of instincts that we won't lose, and we'll see a little here. But then, our reason that we acquire will be able to utilize these instincts to the betterment of others, helping others and helping ourselves as well ascend. Two more paragraphs on this and we'll move on. Spiritism in turn has come to speak a second word that we mentioned in the, of the divine alphabet. Pay attention to it and the word is reincarnation because only through reincarnation we'll be able to do what? Purify our emotions. This word no longer leads them to their deaths, but to the conquest of their own being, elevated and transfigured. Blood redeemed this spirit. And today, the spirit must redeem humans from matter. So, once more, Lazarus is saying, it's necessary for us to better ourselves through reincarnation. Through the body, we see now, even though we are feeling the cold, even though we are suffering with what's going on outside, it's important for us. Because it's a preparation for us to ascend and get to a, be a spirit like he is, or even more, to be a Christ-like spirit. Only then, after this redemption that we come and we purify matter, how would that happen? How do we purify matter that we'll be able to ascend? But how do we purify matter? Remember the example that we just gave? I feel the urge to drink, but I'm not going to do it. It's a body urge. Blame the body, okay, but I'm not going to do it because I'm in control. These trillions of cells that God has given me, I'm in control. I'm going to eat that chocolate. No. Sometimes you give in. Remember, it's a beginning, guys, a beginning, okay? <laughs> There's always tomorrow. But Daniel talked about... Then it talked about the, uh, the new year. So we already have the teachings there. So what we're going to do with it is, is our options, right? It's our decisions. But we see that Lazarus, again, is telling us that we also have to act upon matter, that we are in control, that now is the moment that we're going to free ourselves from this millennials you know, of, of reincarnations, of experiences, that we took the wrong turn, and here we are. Not, it's, not, it's nothing negative that we were trying to you know, bring here, but you know, rather an awareness that we have to bring to one, one another. We're going to read the whole thing because this is important for us. 
and we will digest a little bit this information. And he said, I stated that at the origin, at their origin, humans had only instincts. Therefore, those in, those in whom the instincts dominate are closer to their starting point than to their goal. In order to advance towards the goal, they must overcome the instincts for the sake of the sentiments. That is, perfect the sentiments while dominating the latent seeds of matter. The instincts are the germination and the embryos of sentiments. They bring with them progress, just as the acorn contains the oak. And less advanced individuals are those who, right, reading themselves little by little of their cocoon, remain enslaved to their instincts. The spirit must be cultivated like a field. A fe all future wealth depends on today's labor and much more besides earthly goods. Labor will bring you glorious elevation. It, it is then that comprehending the law of love that unites all beings, you shall find in it the sweetest joy of the soul, which, are, which preludes to the joys of heaven. We can take this whole passage, and he says this at the beginning, by the way, and summarize on what? What Jesus tells us? Love God. Love God above all things. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God above all things. Love your neighbors as yourself. So there are two things here that we can associate these two teachings with. Question 785 of the Spirit's book. What are the what stops us from the from evolving faster? The answer is very simple. There's more to it. Subtle pride and selfishness. When we try to be more than God, we love ourselves more than God, that prideful being that I do it all, I have control of my, over my life. To a certain extent we do, but not more than God. And then what happens? We have to reincarnate again, right? We have to waste a lot of time when it's not a full reincarnation <laughs> to go ahead and get back into track. When we are too selfish, we like ourselves more than our neighbors. Those two feelings that we need, uh, that was cultivated or that was um, um, fed throughout these different reincarnations that we have, throughout the different um, um, internships that we had, when we were, um, when this, the, the, uh, let, me, let me rephrase this, when the spiritual principle was defending their group or hunting, we see a lion now, nowadays, right? Um, hunting a, another animal. And it's, it, sometimes it's tough to watch. But what are they doing? They're eating, surviving. What, ki what law are they responding in their rudimentary way that we study with spiritism? Law of preservation. Can we do that? No. We have reached another level that we say, now survival is different now. Survival is us getting together, not staying in the, in the, in the weather, responding to laws, right? Respecting one another. It's a different way to see the, 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 the whole world now. Years ago, we created laws that said, okay, you know what? If you come in my area, I have the right to what? To shoot, to bear arms. No, it, it's something, sim it, sim it seems simple, but we have to take these steps and say, do we need certain laws? Do we need, do we need certain ways to live that we live nowadays anymore? It's for each one of us to analyze. So. The analysis on this is that we are taking these baby steps. We're still carrying a lot from the past that we have to get rid of, not by chance, because without which, imagine if we didn't have in the, in the, in the animal kingdom the condition of now you have to go and hunt, now you have to go and go get it. Now you have to go and look when we are at the moment of, of um, sharing caves, right? Now you have to go and claim that cave, otherwise your family will perish. And nowadays sometimes we go crazy when we have to buy a house, right? Back in the day we had to 
beat someone to get into that cave. Get out of there. This is my cave. Things are different now. Thank God. In the book, The Consoler, and we have brought this before here, um, when questions were formulated to ask Emmanuel, the, uh, the mentor of Chico Xavier, and a mentor for many of us, obviously, as Joanna de Angelis and many other um, um, teachers, if we can call it that way, um, a question was formulated, question 79 of this beautiful book, unfortunately not in, in English yet. He was asked, how should we interpret our relationship with animal? He, we were asking about relationships with animal. And the sense that, the answer that he brings, brings us a sense of respect, admiration for what these creatures are going through. Because we, to get to the point where we are now, which as we just mentioned, we went through these inter inter interchanges. He answered, considering that the e e they equally have before time a future of fruitful achievements through numerous experiences, they will arrive one day at the so-called human kingdom. They will arrive one, I'm sorry, as for our turn, we will achieve in the flow of the millennium the angelic state. Is what Lazarus was saying that we're going to get to when we really purify our, our ideals to get to this angelic state. The scale of progress is sublime and infinite. In the narrow context of your knowledge, let's seek a figure that invites us to the feeling of solidarity and love that must prevail in all departments of the visible and invisible nature. The minerals is attraction. The plant is feeling. The animal is instinct. Man is reason. We're now bringing the reason to our instinct. The angel is divinity. Let's seek to recognize the myriad of ties that b bind us in the gradual evolution of values and lift up our hearts in the eternal temple of universal brotherhood. Beautiful put, explaining something that has not much to do um, as far as the question directly, but he brings then an explanation of these stages. What are we developing in these um, stages that we, these, the, the, um, the spiritual principle is going through until it becomes this human-like or the spirit that is then um, 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 uh, giving life to matter the way we are right now. But let's talk about this reason a little bit. In the Spirit's book, there are four passages I would like to bring to you. They're related to these questions that you see on the bottom. And it's good for us to, again, give emphasis to this so we can then, later on, when we were talking about know thyself, when we were talking about watch our feelings, well, we don't know where they're coming from. So that's why we're giving emphasis to this. In this part, Kardec is actually studying with the spirits, intelligence and instinct. Intelligence is not an attribute of the vital principle, as we many think that sometimes it's something that we grab a little from the universe, we take it, we reincarnate here, and then we give it back. Because if we think that way, who are we? Right? Especially when we see other individuals that has certain aptitudes that we don't have, uh, sometimes better than us, it's okay to recognize you know, that others are better, we aim to be that way, and we think, Number one, why did he have the option to choose to take certain knowledge, certain intelligence from the, um, the universe, if you can call it that way, and I didn't? Then God is not just, right? And also, we can think that perhaps after that individual dies, he's going to be nothing anyways, so why do I care? Because <laughs> he's going to have to give it back to this, this, this intelligence. Plants are alive, but they do not think. They only have organic life. Intelligence and matter are independent of each other, for a body may be alive yet lack intelligence, but intelligence can only be expressed through the material organs. The source of intelligence is the universal intelligence, again, as he says on the, on the 72, but not in the sense that we just mentioned. Not in the sense that we think that we're taking from it, we we'll take this little part of it, and then we bring it to ourselves, we can associate a little bit with the pantheism as well, thinking that with this part of God, everything is part of God. 
then if we are part of God, God is not complete. Then God is not wise. God is not just. Because if we're part of it and we're not just, then God is not just. And the Spirit explains to us that this is something that is hard for us to grasp where this comes from. What we know for sure is in that transition that from the spiritual principle to spirits, to spirits then we are now with acquiring these experiences and everything is being registered in our pure spirit and then we continue some of the things we leave behind temporarily we don't we have full access of it i.e. us not remembering everything that we have lived in past life for a reason because it would be very detrimental to, our, to us in the level that we are and many other things that we don't need I don't need to remember the lifetimes that I was a great musician. Do you guys know? I was a great musician. But I don't remember anything, so don't ask me anything about music. And then he continues, instinct is not independent of intelligence. It is a type of intelligence, it is a type of intelligence, excuse me. Instinct is non-reasoning intelligence through which all beings provide for their own needs. It's what we see on the plant. There is an instinct to go after light, to create its roots and go after water. And then we see in the animal, we mentioned here about the, the, the lion, or whatever animal going after another and eating, the preservation. This instinct is driving them. And it's beautiful if you go back, please, please, go back to, to um, the, the Genesis when Kardec also talks about this because he brings the awareness of and a hy hypothesis, which is not full, that he brings the mentors, right? As Andrea Luis also bring the mentors of the animals, uh, these beautiful minds that are taking care of these less evolved beings, if we can put it our way, guiding them, right? Here, do this, do that. Or sometimes when we have a feeling that, you know what? Today I'm going to stay home. You know, I'm not going to do anything. Just stay here, read a book or something, and we know that perhaps later on we receive a, 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 a message or something uh, that if we were to go to that location or do whatever we were to do, we would be in trouble. Where's this instinct coming from, right? It's, an, it's, it's something for us to think about it. We cannot draw a line between instincts and intelligence, and we cannot determine when one ends and the other begins, for the fr they frequently con commingle. However, we can very well distinguish the actions that belong to instinct from those that belong to intelligence. We just said it. I, had, I felt the urge not to go, or my instinct is telling me, don't go, don't do this, but I'll do it. I reasoned on it, I made a decision, and the product may be a good product or a negative product. You see the difference? The, f the instinct is there. It's just like the walk that we just mentioned. We walked. But I stopped and I made a turn. That turn can lead me to something great or something very disastrous. Instinct always exists, but humans neglect it. Instinct can also lead to morality. It almost always guides us, sometimes more surely than reason, and never errs. Why it doesn't err? Because we may, it may be contradicting, right? Because it fits something from the past that I need to educate why it never errs? Why I don't stay with those instincts? It's like a child. What do we have to do with the child? You know, they start holding into things to walk, right? To take those first steps. And then the mother holds and the father holds. They put things, you know, near pointy things so they don't, so they don't hit their faces and all because we know that they're going to fall. But we instinctively of also... Um, give them the push. No, you have to go. You have to go. You have to get up, right? You can't stay in a two-year-old mark because it costs a whole lot. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It costs, uh, you know, nowadays with the care that we have, it does cost, but they have to grow. They have to eventually learn something. But that instinct that they have will stay with them for the rest of their lives. The instinct that we just mentioned of walking. When they feel hungry, they eat. But they will reason. We reason as well that, okay, I'm hungry, but I'm going to decide if I'm going to eat little or if I'm going to eat a whole lot. 
if I'm going to eat spices or if I'm just going to eat something very subtle, right? Now we're, e we're reasoning the instinct that we have that the body is telling us to eat as well, but we're going to now do what? We're going to put our touch on it. That's why that when we reason our instincts, we may go wrong. Do you see now the difference? Kirsten bought this uh, some time ago that it, it's connected with this idea of what we just mentioned, that now that I can reason, I create passions, right? For example, um, the person that tries to justify jealousy, what is it? Is it love? Like many like to say, oh no, it's just that I love so much and I'm jealous. No, it's a passion. It's something that, it's a feeling, right, that we put our touch on it. Let's say love is just like water, has no color. But we come and tint it with some blue, some red, some purple. We put our tint on it. And then we call, um, we still call love because of our ignorance and say, oh, no, it's love. But no, it's jealousy. You try to you know, keep the person to yourself. You think that person is your belonging. But do passions indicate evolvement? Development, yes, but not perfection. They are a sign of activity and awareness of the self. Now we're making decisions. Now I choose to be this way, not the other way. Whether um, I am doing this in a, in a um, organized way, if we can say that way, um, but I am making choices. It's my choice. And the consequences of this later will come later on for sure when the person, the, the other individual leaves you because you're too demanding. <laughs> but here we are, and, and Kirsten mentioned this. In this study of talking about the emotions, I personally, and uh, I'm sorry again for my personal note here, um, become in love with this whole thing. Um, especially when he started ta talking about um, not only the self, but the interactions in itself. Beautiful Daniel, uh, Daniel uh, Goleman, author of Emotional Intelligence, um, and he's a psychologist as well. This is some of the books, um, and it, it's just an amazing, an amazing um, study uh, for all of us to go deeper and deeper on it. The cases that are brought um, that it's just an amazing thing to see now our society leaving um, the 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 old being that we that we were, accepting things the way they were, and saying no, not anymore. Now we're gonna sit down. We're gonna question this. Why is this so? What kind of connection this has to with our brains, right? And there is a lot to. Uh, I wouldn't say questionable because the man is. Um, light years in front of many of us, especially myself, I include myself on it. But again, this touch of the spirituality, we still have to bring this component and we're walking towards that, um, towards that area as well. But just the idea of questioning, and this is what I would like to um, bestow upon each of you, of questioning the feeling is what I want to emphasize with this man. We can even say, okay, Leo, I'll just, you know, we'll hold a little bit the, uh, the, the, the gospel according to spiritism, but go and read these books. At least start with this, the emotional intelligence. It's an amazing thing because it will make you think. At home, at work, you're like, okay, why did I burst that way? Or why did that other individual took my answer in a negative way? I wasn't thinking negatively. It was just an answer that, what, what was happening in the area, that person's life, all these questions will come about. But it's a, be a beautiful study for us um, to bring into our lives as well. Here where we start now the journey of would like to bring um, the, the, the ways that we can keep the balance uh, or to at least educate our emotions. We brought about 10 topics here that we would like to share and mainly because this is what we saw that was, let's say, pertinent to 
the different religions that we see nowadays, Buddhism, Protestants, uh, Catholics, um, science with Daniel um, Goleman as well, um, and, and many other topics that we see, not necessarily we have to respond to them in the same order or do um, the things that we have to do um, um, the same way, but to really say, okay, do I know myself? In the Spirit's book, we see in question 919, what is the most effective means for improving ourselves in this life and for resisting the draw of evil? Very simple. A sage of antiquity has told you, know thyself. Mm -hmm. Know thyself. How do we get to know ourselves? We have some, uh, we have some, we have, this is actually Greek. Excuse me. Um, know thyself. How do we get to know ourselves? We just had, had a glimpse of, of what we are, where we are, and where we come from. And because of the different experiences that we already have, because the feelings that I have inside of myself, right, the, the ideas that I have created about the universe, I can also understand where I'm going. It, it seems simple, but when do we really stop and think about this? If I'm a person who loves to um, study math, when I discarnate, what will I find myself doing? Studying history? No. History of math. Thank you, Alba. Very, very good. Perhaps I will go to the archives and go back to the old Greeks, right? How they perceive math and, and then, and then, and then. How am I going to be, and I'm now taking a step forward, you know, take a step you know, ahead of us. What am I going to be when I discarnate if I am attached to my belongings? Am I going to free myself? You see, this is important for us, this first step, knowing ourselves. Because we can talk about all night of what the spirit is, what we are, uh, that we have a lot of instincts still, but what's inside of each one of us, it's your product. It's something that we have to dive in. The other question that we like to formulate is that, okay, I know myself, but how do I, now that I understand a little bit, how do I act? How do I go about doing the right thing, knowing that this is the time, this is the new beginning? And we quite often come in contact with this, these questions. What, and, and Kardec actually talked to, um, asked the spirits um, on the understanding of good and evil, on question 629 he asked, what definition may be given to morality? because I want to be a more evolved individual. Morality is the rule of good conduct. In other words, being able to distinguish between good and evil, it is founded on the observance of God's law. Human behave correct, humans behave correctly when they do everything for the good of all, for then they obey God's law. It's not for my own sake, but the sake of others, right? Because when I think about myself and I act for myself, I'm still going the other way, selfishness and pride that we saw earlier today. But we're still, we're still up in the air. Um, nice. Um, but what is good and, and evil? Even the word evil, I'll give an example. This past um, Thursday, we were in our study of the gospel according to spiritism. And a friend asked, um, why the word evil? Connecting with the idea the evil Satan uh, that was created by men, by the church, to petrify us, that they will come and you know send us to the eternal hell. And this evil is the absence of goodness. Right here, six thirty. How can we distinguish between good and evil? Good is everything that is in harmony with the law of God. And evil is everything that deviates from it. Thus, doing what is good confirms God's law, while doing evil infringes upon the law. Simple, isn't it? It's not that somebody is creating, you know, God create this evil being to excite us and say, 
go the other way. One is the, on this side and the other, the angel on this side. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's that lawyer, right? That is, it's the court of law that is inside of us. Our conscience. <laughs> the court of law that we mentioned at the beginning, the Miranda rights. And then on question 631, do humans have the means within them to distinguish between good and evil? And here it is. Very interesting. Yes, when they believe in God and desire to know God, who has given them intelligence to discern one from the others, and we go back to do unto others what we wish to be done unto us. If this is going to harm me if I were to ask somebody to do upon me, because we don't do anything wrong against ourselves, right? We don't hurt ourselves, do we? We do. <laughs> we actually do. Because we don't, we're not utilizing our free will yet the way we're supposed to do. We're not um, 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 conducting ourselves the way we're supposed to conduct. As Kirsten said uh, uh, last week, and Joanna DeAngeli reminds us, conductor or our willpower the way we should conduct. So yes, we do hurt ourselves. So most likely, we'll hurt others too. Then we have to stop and ask, what am I asking for myself? But we do have intelligence. Even though the reason in this level may affect the instinct that is guiding me to the, wrong pl to the right place, and I may take the wrong turn, but I'm also intelligent enough to get up, stand up, shake it off, and keep going, and keep going. The girls are laughing, right? Just shake it off. The second thing, change your perspective. You will see this so widely on the, this different um, um, ideals of, or change of ideals when we talk about emotions, for us to change the lenses of our lives. When we is expect a response from another being, whether verbally or nonverbal, um, uh, or something that may happen, whatever. We have a preconceived idea that that's going to happen. We're expecting, right? But what if it doesn't happen? What happens to us? We get upset. We curse. We say blasphemy. We call God's name in vain. All kinds of crazy stuff. Because our perspective of the world is very narrowed. And when we tend, or at least allow ourselves to change this perspective, things are, things are different. And if it happened, if we receive anything different from what we were expecting, it's okay. We understand the level of my neighbor, of our neighbors. We understand my level as well, and say, okay, we're going to continue on. It was not what I was thinking it was going to happen, but it's okay. It's, it's very important in this journey that we have to educate our emotions. That it may not be this way. Life it may be different tomorrow as it was different yesterday. So changing this perspective is very important. Kirsten, that just at the end of the year, I also talk about self-esteem. Why is important the self-esteem in this education of the emotion? Why is it? We have to think highly of ourselves. We have to think, and we say it here over and over, that if we're here today under this beautiful roof, light, computers, microphone, recording, right, our glasses, we have made a great, huge advancement, as well as for us to sit with all these beautiful conditions that we have created for ourselves and talk about emotions, my goodness, men and women, children together, we have to think highly of yourselves, that we have conquered a beautiful ground thus far. And it's not by chance. It took a lot of power, a lot of energy, courage for many for us to be the way we are right now. Our garments, the laws that we have in this country as an example for other countries as well in the world. It's an, an amazing thing that there are so many things that we can say about ourselves that will boost our self-esteem that will boost the self-esteem of others that we sometimes we just take for granted. So the third step, very important for all of us, self-esteem. We have to take it to that maximum level right there. Empathy. My God. This right here 
every place, when, whenever we talk about emotions, you know, you can Google it, you know, in, in different arenas of life, you will see this word, that empathy is something that we should establish in our lives, as well as sympathy for some of them. There is this discussion about the empathy is when we can truly connect with the person. For example, if the person is, um, has a cold, right, in this cold season and all that, and we just, a couple months ago, we had the cold, the flu. We know how it hurt, right? We know how it really brings us down. You have, it's easy for you to establish that empathy versus just a sympathy that you say, okay, you'll be better, you'll be fine. I know, just, you know, take some coding, whatever you have to take and things. Will, but when you are able to establish that empathy with that other individual, that true connection, because it felt it, you felt on your bones, then the, um, the other individual um, can feel it better, can heal faster. But there is another side to this. We always associate the idea of empathy and sympathy um, when it's something negative, when the other is crying. But what about having empathy when someone is um, happy? We don't think about that much, right? Someone comes to you and say, you know what, I got that promotion. And you're like, okay, congratulations, and you keep going. No, we should excite ourselves saying, congratulations, that is awesome, because perhaps it has happened to you already, and you want to feel that joy with that individual, right? It's the empathy and the positive side that you're like, oh my God, this is great. That feeling of happiness that was 10 points, it becomes 100 times you know, bigger that, you know, in that, that, that exhaustion of happiness, if we can put it that way, because you connected with that individual. You had empathy for that feeling of happiness, for that feelings of, feeling of joy, or even that sympathy that when you're like, okay, nice, let's keep going. What can I do? What can I learn from you? This is great. You got there before me. It's okay. We put ourselves aside. Because it's easy for us to connect these things to the negative, because this is what we are still pondering on the negative. What am I doing? What not? But let's have empathy as well for the goodness inside of us. Prayer. Why is prayer important on this idea of emotion? Prayer is what? Is the moment that we have with God, with our Creator, and what we do when we're praying. Uh? Connecting to the highest. But what did the Spiritism ask us to, or at least teach us to do. Be gr gratitude, praise, and ask. Most of the time we're asking, right? Please take this person away from me or take, this, take me out of this job, take me out of this situation. But what about God? Why do I feel this way? Why do I, and you give that moment, you're actually talking to God and trying to understand who you are. It's the beginning. Most of the time, we don't even want to start. We want to run from it, right? Talk about emotions, forget it. You know, they will know my secrets. No, it's not that way. We need to talk, especially with God. So prayer is important on this, this exchange of energy with our dear Creator. In a way to liberate ourselves with our, uh, from our difficulties and receive the new that God is, uh, is able to um, give us. We have to wait. It doesn't come right away, right? It's that um, connection that we have to establish and make it pure enough that perhaps in one day it will come much faster. To follow this, we also notice that meditation is a very interest, um, well-known, discussed topic on this idea, on this road of educating our emotions. The ability to sit like this man and say, now it's a moment for me to reflect about what happened today, about uh, what happened the other day, because your emotions, your feelings with the physical reactions that you had at that moment as well, that shock that you had creating those emotions at the time was not appropriate for you to sit down and look at the sun. You would be like, the sun, whatever, you know, you want to, but then you have that moment to say, here is, I need to sit down and think about this and reason this whole thing. 
understand my instincts that, I'm, that is pushing me to do something that perhaps I may regret later. And sometimes we think that it has to be the, the way that the man is doing over here, which has not, no, no, it's not a problem. And, and Joanna D'Angelo Emanuel tells us to have this moment in our lives daily. But it can also be when we are doing something around the house, because we do things so mechanically and our mind is going someplace else, right? Why can't we take those moments to say, I'm gonna think about something productive. I'm gonna think about that emotion that struck me earlier today and why I felt that way. We have to be careful. We don't wanna do that sometimes, you know, cooking because we may not want to, we may not want to imprint those feelings on the food that we make and all those things. But sometimes if you're washing things, right? You know, washing something at the house, you go and wash that feeling, taking a shower. Thank you, Yasko. Right? Why not? Because sometimes we have to be, kids, don't make any noise because now I'm going to meditate. You try to do that and you tell me if it works. It won't work. <laughs> or the dog. Or the, the and then you kind of create more emotions <laughs> doing your meditation. So the invitation is for us to take a step back and think about it in the means that we have. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that widely holds us back. We talked about enough, and we will talk about more and more and more because we need it, that holds us back. The reason, one of the main reasons we brought forgiveness is that there are a lot of spirits um, that are still in, 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 their, in their state of depression, in the state of, of, of um, suffering because they haven't forgiven themselves, and they haven't forgiven others yet. And they go many, many years without the capability of letting it go. And it's also charity. And here it is, the answer that was given by the spirits to Kardec when he asked, what is the true meaning of the word charity as Jesus understood it? Benevolence towards everyone, indulgence towards the imperfection of others, and forgiveness for offenses. So it's a must, without which, we won't be able to think about the next emotion. There was an issue that was created. Someone harmed you, or someone comes and harm us, and we have to analyze. We can carry with us, as Daniel liked to say, one, two, the third day, enough. <laughs> right, Daniel? Take and stop, right? We have to digest that and let it go. Wash it, wash it off, wash it off. Don't think. Let's not think that things will change overnight. It may take years before we can go ahead and be able to even forgive that other individual or have the opportunity to show that you in fact forgive. Because as you may not be in the same page with that person, the other person may not be on the page, on the same page of the ideal of, on the ideal of forgiveness. So we gotta be patient to ourselves. Patience, patience, and patience. Develop new virtues. Very nice. Okay, today I can get up in the morning and do certain chores, certain things, to be on time to get to work. Or I can prepare myself in a way during the week that I have certain a lot of times to do certain things. Or I can um, stop from whatever I'm doing and only focus on the study of the day, whether I'm studying something for the center or for school. How many times we find ourselves going everywhere? Virtues that we still have to um, establish that perhaps for some of us, they sit down and they can stop, they can do this, they can do that. Um, they, there are virtues in, in, in many other ways as well that it really, you ask, we ask ourselves, how can an individual can, can do it? If they can do it, we can do it too, because we are sons and daughters of God. It's just a matter of us exercising our free will and our willpower as we have seen it here. Look at this, and this is gonna tie it up to the next um, um, idea. This is what Gandhi brought to us, the seven dangers to human virtue. And you may, you may have seen this going um, on Facebook here and there. Number one, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, 
business without ethics, science without humanity, religion without sacrifice, politics without principle. What do we see here? That we're going everywhere, we're taking the pleasures of the physical environment without coordinating ourselves, without asking ourselves why we're here. And this is detrimental to any development of new virtue because we don't have any sense of direction. If I take my car and say, I'm going to drive, drive where? Where are you going? We have a sense that we have to go home. Perhaps we have to go to the market. We have to do this. We have to do that. It may not be um, written on a piece of paper to remind us, but at least we have some sense of direction. The same thing is when we ca keep our lives without a sense of direction, these are the pitfalls right here. And Joanna De Angelis, to bring um, towards the end of this ideals of for us to have a better, um, in, in a way for us to educate our, our emotions, she tells us to have a goal, to establish the goal, to establish direction, plan something. In the book, and also CD, Living and Loving, she brings the following. Ask yourself what you expect from life how you plan to achieve, achieve it, and why you want it. I'm going to read it again. Ask yourself what you expect from life. How do you plan to achieve, achieve it, and why you want it? We're not going to tell you here that this is a plan for a thousand years from now, which Spiritism tells us to think about it. Let's think about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. This reincarnation at least. This reincarnation at least. Then make sure that you plan how to achieve it, and why you want it. Appraise the contents of your uh, aspirations and compare them with the teachings of the gospel. Then choose the most sensible course of action. Ponder over what you have been through, what you have already sown and reaped. You see, the before and the now. The before and the now. It's very important because if I establish a goal for myself and Three weeks from now, when I'm lifting that weight to lose that extra 10 pounds that the body is not losing at all because it has reached that plateau, right? You have to say, okay, why has it reached that plateau? As Daniel said, I don't want to, you know, stop the diet, then do something different because the body has become conditioned to those exercises, and this is where you're going to be. You need to confuse yourself, you need to confuse the cells so you lose a little bit more. The same thing with our emotions. Now I have to take a different, um, 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 a different, a, a different uh, um, approach. Thank you. A different approach to analyze. Thank you, Yasko. To analyze what I'm trying to accomplish. If you are not sure about the right choice, stop and pray. Prayer again, seeking inspiration from the higher realms. Answers will certainly come that will enable you to perceive what is real and most convenient for you, how to achieve it, and why you want it. Joanna De Angelis is great for these teachings, and Devaldo Franco exercised this so well, and he gives us many, many tips on this, and his life is an example of it. What did he really want from life? And here it is. He's exercising it. Work. We'll finalize with work, guys. You know, we hear all the time that time heals everything. Does it? It does. But if you sit idle, does it heal anything? <laughs> the emotion comes back and you're like, oh my God, here we are again, thinking about that problem, that issue. But when you have to get up in the morning and you have to produce something, right? You have to go and wash, you have to do this, you have to do that. You put your life to work, you give meaning to that moment, then things become much easier. It's putting the horse to plow the area so you can plant the right seeds, our physical body. So time does heal when we're working. When we're idle, we're not gonna go anywhere. And there is a beautiful passage towards the end of um, the law of work, of labor, on the third part of the Spirit's book, that Kardec makes a very um, interesting point 
about the necessity that we have, analyzing the necessity that we have to share more and produce and exchange things with one another in a more effective way, that this idea of work is still very um, infant in our minds. Uh, you know, when we think about work, we think it's something that is there to hurt us, to, to make us miserable every day when we get up in life and we go to do whatever. It's the opposite. It, it's for us to enlighten ourselves, to exchange ideals, to exchange feelings as well, to understand ourselves, how we perceive the world, and help others too. Does anybody remember what Lazarus said at towards the end? That the blood has redeemed us to this point, and it still is because we still feel the flesh very intensively. But now that we have this reason to take care of it, and the instinct to kind of like, okay, I can make choices. What are we doing? We're then changing the physical, the matter around ourselves, the environment around us. And then he will say later on that perhaps that's what they were doing. The angelic minds, they're coming back to us and saying, here what it is. Here's what we need to do. Here's some guidance. Let me lead you this way. Here's what has happened to me as we can see on heaven and hell, the many examples in the second part that we'll talk about next week with Adriano Barbo, that I did this, thus, this is me now. Very interesting. Work is very interesting to all of us. As we mentioned at the beginning, this man, Dr. King, we would like to finalize with it as well. When towards his speech, he invited us to let it ring. Let freedom ring in the many our areas of our country, right? Of what was going on. It was the freedom of, of oppression. It was the freedom of what we were going through in, that, in, in, in the decade that he was living and many, many years prior, right? For 100 years, we had established laws, ideals in our lives, but we were not cashing the right check. As he said, the check was coming back with insufficient funds. Insufficient funds. And then he says the following. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rocky of Crockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the cur 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 curvaceous excuse me, peaks of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and every molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom, freedom, freedom ring when we let freedom ring, when we let, let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And we ask that we let freedom ring in our hearts to forget the old being, to educate the old being, and let freedom ring in our lives as well. We thank you, and we would like to open for questions if you have any or comments in this idea of emotions. Thank you, Leo. I don't remember is the gospel of the spirit book, uh, but anyways, uh, when express the evolution of our emotion, we go through instinct, sentiment, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, my question is more regarding of terminology. I don't know if you will be able to respond. <laughs> somebody in the room, 
about what's the, is there a difference between the word sentiment and the word emotion? Or it really is, or is the same thing? Let us say that sentiment, if we can put it that way, and we may express it as feeling, is what the spirit has, is what we have. Because, as we were saying, we may blame the body for a desire to drink. But is the really the physical body who wants to drink? Or is the sentiment, as a spirit that I have, that is commending or gives me the sensation that I have to drink? That sentiment, okay? For you to understand in this connection with our what we're talking about. Because again, some people may describe it as feeling, all right? The emotion that we were trying to bring is the combination of what the body is imposing on us, the physical body, right? We can say feeling, along with the sentiment that will produce the emotion. Is it clear now? Now, again, you may, we may come in contact with individuals talking about feelings, um, but they're really talking about the sentiment. Feelings talk really about the, the, the emotions. So for us to at least ha have a better understanding of what we're talking about is that I have our feelings as a spirit. We have our feelings as spirit. The certain needs that we have created. The physical body also have its needs, right? And we can say that that's also a sentiment or, or more a feeling of the, the matter that the necessity to eat, necessity to drink, necessity to hydrate, to take care of ourselves. And the imposition of those feelings along with our sentiments becomes our emotions. More of a product, you see? Oh, I, I like that seven, what's the warning from Gandhi? Uh, that put um, virtues in danger. Uh, because to the left side, we sometimes tend to criticize people as a negative thing. Wealth is negative, pleasure is negative, too much knowledge leading to what? Business also, science, you know, people that uh, are religious would say science is not, and we scientists would say religions for what, and politics. So the, le the left words here, we, there are nothing wrong with those. That's what I think is beautiful. The quality that we give to those actions or feelings or emotions are up to us. So it may become negative, put a negative quality to wealth, negative quality to pleasure, to knowledge, to science. If I do science without humanity, now is a bad science. But the science becomes bad. Or religion, which is wonderful, but if it's done just for the pleasure, or for just to show off beautiful, you know, uh, clothing, all this power, is bad. The Pope is trying to tell us now we have they have to sacrifice for the people. And politics we always criticizing, right? But that is a is we can is a good thing if we give a good quality to politics. It's definitely a good point because we think bless you. We think that um that all these things that we have created um even technology, you know, we tend to, oh, it's too bad. It's, well, the emphasis that we put to it and the degree that we allow ourselves to get in contact with, then is the problem. It's the extremes. In the Spirit's book, forgive me, forgive me I don't have the, uh, the right, the number of the question, but we are warned on the problems of life when we get to the, these extremes, right? Am, is this controlling me or am I still in control of, um, these things. When wealth, um, I ha let's say if we were born in a wealthy family. So if it's bad, then God is not just because God placed me in this wealthy family. No. What are you going to do with it is what's important. How are we going to utilize that wealth? And the other things that you mentioned as well is what's important and how much emphasis are we going to put to it. Paula, did you raise your 
wanted to reference and put a plug backwards to the talk Kirsten and I gave that one of the best ways to develop emotional intelligence is through active listening, which you emphasized when you got into the empathy. And if we can bring that to mind, especially with young children, we were even talking about expanding God at home to include some feelings expression or having a little family meeting, that the more that we empathize, the more we're helping that other person stop and feel the feeling. And then they're welcome to tell us, no, it wasn't that feeling, it was another feeling. But I think we can't revisit active reflective listening, empathic hearing enough because it's really a continual mindfulness is our word now to keep practicing, practicing it until it becomes second nature. Without one, the other will not exist. How can we have empathy if we don't listen, right? Because if we don't listen, we don't know what the person is talking about. The person has just expressed. So very well put, very well reminded. And it, it is true because sometimes we, did, we just tend to shut it off. Whoa, the person is here again. I have to listen to this individual, that situation. They go, it just happened again. But are we really listening? Are we really actively listening? So very well put. Sort of quasi piggyback of what Paula said, if we can imagine how in the ways in which our own spirit guides or guardian angels are with us, they are empathetic. They are listening to us. They know how to deal with us like a good psychologist would. And they know the things to say to us or whisper in our ear, even without us even realizing. So this is sort of our own internship. You know, learning to talk and deal with one another will help us in the future be mentors of other people. So now it's just an internship. It's a time for us to practice with one another, learning how to listen, to empathize, and to communicate therapeutically with one another. Because on a greater level, in a world of regeneration, there's going to be much more of that across the board. And I know uh, Paula, not too long ago, shared an article, I think it was from the New York Times, about a, a huge spread on emotional intelligence. So it's really catapulting and going mainstream for in terms of education for children at a young age and then wanting them to implement that in the educational system. So it really is something important and it's really not independent of spiritism. It really is integrated into it, especially with Joanna DeAndres. One last thing, because I know it's 7.30 and we have to um, move on to our passes, but it's so interesting when you talk, when you mentioned, I forget the question in Spirit's book about instinct versus intelligence and that we should always listen more to our intelligence than what we think is right because we can rationalize in our mind thinking well I'm going to go and do this but instinctively you know it's wrong like you know that eating that piece of chocolate is wrong but you rationalize in your mind I'm using chocolate because it's the most it's funny but we, or we know that being with this person instinctively you know it's wrong but you rationalize it and you convince yourself but it, that's why the spirits say always go first with your, your instinct. If you, if you feel like you know your gut feeling tells you not to do it, then don't do it. Go with that over your own rational mind. I thought that was the most powerful thing that the spirits were, were sharing. But uh, thank you, Leo. I would just to finalize, and I think it's very interesting that, that Paula and Kirsten mentioned this, you know, talking about how we relate um, well, with one another in our mentors to, uh, with ourselves. You know, even the, this, these things right here, um, to have pleasure. How are we going to teach others to have pleasure? How are we going to teach others to be wealthy, not only in the economical way um, later on, if we're not exercising these things now? If we're not exercising our scientific sides or religious sides, right? A politics, when we're dealing with one another, it's politics. How will we be able to um, stand and one day in a greater realm and say, now it's time for me to go ahead and lead this, that person, or a group of individuals. So with that in mind, we would like to, um, what was that, Kirsten? Okay. Final comment. Is 3.5 million years ago a lot? Okay. It's a whole lot. Yes, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, and to think 
that our dear Master Jesus, uh, with this beautiful question, has been guiding every step of the way. We have to think that he, if he was the governor helping others to guide us, to help us at that time, we can imagine when he reached the level of angelic being, right? Just something for us to think about it while we then transition to our passes because it's always good to have this um, connection with Jesus um, when we're, um, again, um, receiving the passes, providing the passes along with the higher mind. So we'll leave on this picture right here that everybody likes so much. I can actually send this um, if you want to, and um, we can talk more about it later on. We would like them to pass to the second part of this meeting where we will um, invite the practitioners to um, the passes. We'll ask Kirsten to turn on the light. We'll do a short visualization and connect with higher minds. Thank you. 